Father, thank you for your grace and for your love and for the privilege that we have to fellowship together for just a few moments. May the Holy Spirit construct our time together so that our Lord receives the praise, the honor, and the glory. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. It's a it's a it's a unusual 70 degrees here in southeast Oklahoma. When God created, he created time, and one of the greatest gifts that we've been given from God is time. Twice we are told in his word that we should redeem the time. And I think that as we begin a new year, I want to give you seven assurances that we have uh, from the Lord from the 17th chapter of John, uh, his high priestly prayer. There are many Christians today who struggle with the idea that, that they're, they're, they've been redeemed, that they are, they're secure in Christ, and I want to talk about that just for a bit. Jesus Christ is not some man that was born in Bethlehem of Judea some 2,000 years ago. We're told in 2 John that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that God became man and He dwelt among us. And the clear inference, of course, is His pre-existence. The Lord we worship, the Lord God that we know and that we worship, uh, is the sovereign God of eternity. He didn't begin 2,000 years ago. He always was. And He chose, He deigned to become our kinsman redeemer, taking on flesh so that He might be our substitute and redeem us completely, totally, paying the price. When you stop to think that He's God Almighty, that He's God in the flesh, God of very God, then folks, it is inconceivable, it's impossible that Christ would pray anything that was not God's will. What Christ prayed has to be God's will. More than that, it must come to pass. In the second verse of the 17th chapter of John, he says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life, eternal life, to as many as thou hast given him. The prayer begins in verse 1. I'm only quoting verse 2. Eternal life eternal life. Dearly beloved, eternal life isn't something like a baseball that you can throw away. Uh, it's life that never ends no matter what the circumstances are. You have eternal life with God. That's absolutely God's will. And Christ prays that you have that in the 10th verse. Christ prayed, all mine, all are mine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Well, uh, so he's glorified in some, right? You know, but most of you live such a rotten life, he can't be glorified. You, folks, you can't do that with this verse. You can't do that with this prayer. They're his. Are some more his than others? But you can't do that. Every single one of us, dearly beloved, are just as precious to Christ. They belong to God, and they belong to Christ God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Christ died in our place. 
what is God's is Christ's, and what is Christ's is God's. You know, I think that it would be difficult to have any verse that more clearly speaks of the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ than 2 John 6, but, but here's another. All mine are thine. All thine are mine. And dearly beloved, clearly the Lord Jesus Christ is God and we belong to Him. We do not belong to the world system. We don't belong to Satan. And we do not belong to ourselves. We're His. And every single last one of His is precious. The 11th verse states, I am no more in the world but these are in the world holy father keep thou thine own keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me in order that it's a henna clause a purpose clause in order that they may be one as we are one so folks don't waste your time trying to get me involved in some movement so that, we, well, we all might be one in Christ. That we all might be one as Christ prayed. You know, wouldn't it be nice if Christ's prayer was answered? Well, the inference, folks, clearly is that it was. If Christ's prayer was not answered, then it's not the will of God. Dearly beloved, we have the testimony of Scripture. You have the testimony of Scripture. If you're a Christian, you have the testimony of God Almighty that if you ask anything according to His will, He'll do it. We are one. No human effort's going to make us one. No group of churches or any other organization that gets together to try to come up with some kind of an agreement that all are are willing to compromise enough to accept will make us one. We are one. We are one because we're His. We're not one because we act like one. We are not one because we've, well, we've agreed to get together and try to be one. Dearly beloved, we are one because we're His. Keep these that are in the world. Holy Father, keep through Thine own name those whom Thou hast given Me, that they may be one. That's an assurance that you have, dearly beloved. That is your promise. That is your promise from God. You're not only one, but you are kept. Guarded is the word in the Greek. You are guarded. If you're not guarded, then Christ's prayer is not answered. And we know it was. Verse 15, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you'd keep them in the world and keep them, guard them, from the evil, it's articulated, it's a particular evil. And folks, it is amazing how many preachers try to come up with sermons to make sure that you're kept from evil. Try to work out the way that you live your life and the things that you do in order that, that you'll be, somehow you'll be kept from evil and bring glory to the Lord. And I have never, never heard one of them refer to the 15th verse of the 17th chapter of John. 
Dearly beloved, Christ's prayer to God was that you be kept from the evil. You suppose you will be? Well, if you're not, God's lied and He's lost everything. You don't deserve heaven. You don't deserve God's grace. I don't deserve God's grace. Think what God would lose if those words were not true. Here is a promise that you, despite your condition, your situation, if you're His, you will be kept from the evil. You may not think that. You may not believe that. People have said to me, well, Steve, you don't know how much I sin. I don't want to know that. If you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, you are kept, guarded from the evil. The 17th verse. I pray that you sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And folks, there is a... There is a tremendous move in Christianity today that you need to settle down and sanctify yourself. And there is not one single passage of Scripture that ever exhorts you to sanctify yourself. It's always God who does it. Paul says, I pray, God, that your whole body, soul, and spirit be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. And read the next verse. Faithful is He that called you who also will do it. He will do it. Christ prayed that you'd be sanctified. That God set you apart for himself suppose he didn't suppose he did not do that think what that would mean christ jesus christ god almighty incarnate in human flesh prayed something that didn't happen folks you are not only guarded from the evil you are set apart to God. In the 23rd verse, he's praying, I in them and thou in me that they may be made complete, perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Made perfect in one. The word is complete. Made complete. And we are complete in Him. That takes us to Colossians. We are complete in Him. You are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. Now you may not look that way. But dearly beloved, you are. There's absolutely nothing that needs to be done as far as you're concerned. In God's presence, you are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Dearly beloved, God loves you as He loved Christ. In that 23rd verse, how much do you suppose that God the Father loved God the Son? How much? Loved them as thou hast loved me. Folks, think of it. Think about it. That the Almighty God, the Creator of heavens, heaven and earth, loves you as He loved the incarnate Christ. And then in the 24th verse, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory that thou hast given me. For you've loved me before 
the foundation of the world. There again, folks, is scriptural testimony to the deity of Jesus Christ, that God, Jesus is God Almighty incarnate in human flesh. God of very God. But, but think of it. I also pray, and it's my will, that they be with me. I cannot, I cannot imagine how many sermons are preached on what you have to do to make sure that you're going to be with Him. That take your mind off Christ and, and it, well, it puts it, you put your mind down here in the garbage pit in which you live. This is a testimony of Jesus Christ and what He's done for you. And, I, and folks, I am not suggesting that you don't have any obligation, that you have no responsibility at all. What I am saying is that all of that obligation is vested in love and to sit and make a list of things that Christians ought to do or not do will not work separate from the love of God. So there are seven tremendous truths that are yours. Not only for last year, but for this coming new year. As we await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, may our Lord Jesus Christ come soon. Come Lord Jesus, please come soon. These promises, folks, they have to be true because they are the will of our God. I love you all, I truly do. Rest in Him. Know that He loves you with an everlasting love. That He holds you in the hollow of His hand. That He knows the path that you take. That when He's tested you, you shall come forth as gold. That He bottles your tears. He's written your name on the palm of His hand. Folks, He loves you, and nothing will ever change that. And we love you too. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.